Deal Beach in days of yore was a site that those that had the privilege to work the boats there would not change their way of life for anything. Amongst these storm warriors are a couple I'm going to mention here, the Baileys and Freddie Upton. Bill Bailey lived at number 5 Brewer Street where he raised his family. He had two mentionable boats on the beach opposite the Star and Garter Hotel. One, the Reform was named after the lugger reform that was lost under Dill Pier while trying to effect a launch in bad weather in 1871. Bill's grandfather, John Bailey, and John's brother Henry were part owners of the ill-fated lugger reform. Had it not been that Henry had to lay the lower wood on that ill-fated night, he would not have survived. John served in the Navy during his youth and was present at the bombardment of St John Dark in 1840. John Bailey bought his lugger the reform without assistance on one of many occasions from an awful eventful cruise in the channel. A solitary figure at the helm, he landed on Dill Beach to break the sad news to anxious wives and sweethearts. The tragic news that the lugger's punt had been swamped in approaching a vessel in distress. And before he could come to his fellow shipmate's aid with the lugger, his three comrades had perished before his eyes. John crossed the bar on his 83rd year on the 14th of January 1902. Getting back to Bill Bailey. Bill had a memorable career as a dual boatman, affecting many rescues from the lifeboat and from his own boat. Bill never knew his father, who was drowned in the galley punt Forrester's Pride five months before he was born in 1893. In the First World War, Bill served with the Royal Navy Beach Party landing at Gallipoli, and then after being invalided out, invalided out of the Navy in 1917, he continued his life as a longshoreman and fisherman. He also started his long service in the lifeboat, Barbara Fleming at Kingsdown. Since 1917, he took part in all major rescues and salvage jobs, either in the motorboat or a lifeboat, beginning with the American steamer Piave, which was lost on the West Goodwin on her maiden voyage. He was a bellman on the warmer lifeboat under Joe Mercer and succeeded Freddie Upton in 1945 as second coxswain. He was the only member of the lifeboat crew to board the Captain Andrew which was driving dangerously in fierce southerly gale near the, south of, near the rounds of the South Goodwin. He held two vellums for his part in the rescue of the crews of the Silvia Ornato and the Argon which both went ashore on the Goodwins and broke their backs. Whilst Bill was second coxswain under Freddie Upton he achieved a daring rescue of the storm-battered French yacht by Albatross near the Goodwins. Thirteen Stone Bill, the oldest member aboard the lifeboat, flung himself inboard of the yacht. He then sailed the yacht round the North Goodwins, from where the lifeboat towed Bill and the Frenchman into Ramsgate Harbour. Bill's boats were, if not fishing or hired to anglers, all, always all ready to launch to any casualty. Serving with Freddie Upton on the lifeboat, they also undertook the task of running a doctor out to the ships that required one. This was done either in Freddie's Rose and Mary or the lifeboat. The doctor was James Hall. If you come across a book called The Sea Surgeon, it will give you accounts of his work. Dr James Simkin Hall died on Wednesday the 12th of February 1975 at the age of 75. He was known by everybody all over the world as the lifeboat doctor having put to sea more than 200 times during the war in the warmer lifeboat in answer to SOS calls for a surgeon. He was granted the Freedom of Deal in 1966 in recognition of his 30 years service with warmer lifeboat from which he attended almost 1,000 seamen injured in the Channel and the North Sea. Many operations were performed on board the ship and 80 mile gales were commonplace with Dr Hall having to remain on board as the lifeboat couldn't retrieve him. One day, in September 1945, the lifeboat launched with Dr Hall in atrocious conditions. 
Dr. Hall jumped 12 foot from the ship's ladder as a wave swept the lifeboat underneath him. The lifeboatman grabbed him and he turned to the coxswain and said, it wasn't diphtheria after all, only a septic throat. During the war, his service as a doctor took him over 400 hours and 2,000 miles in the lifeboat. In 1961, he published his account of his works in his book, Sea Surgeon, which was a bestseller. He was appointed an OBE in 1946. He also wrote his biography, A Surgeon's Life, in 1970, from which I'm not sure if it was ever published. He gave orders for it not to be printed until after his death. He said there are some hair-raising tales in it, which would cause red faces in high places, so it's worth looking out for. Written in the Whitstable and Hearn Bay Herald, Saturday, November the 12th, 1892, is the following story. Some extensive seizures of contraband goods were made at Dill last week by the customs officials. At the petty sessions on Thursday, Edward Spratlin, grocer's manager, was charged with harbouring and receiving 43 pounds of manufactured and Cavendish tobacco, with intent to defraud Her Majesty's customs. Robert Day, boatman, was similarly charged in respect of nine and a half pounds, and Ernest Dean in respect of four and a half pounds. The cases were adjourned until Thursday next, and the treble value of duty being deposited, and the defendant submitted to bail. On Thursday, the 17th of November, 1892, the cases in which three defendants were charged with harbouring and unaccustomed tobacco were heard again at the Dill Petty Sessions. Dr. Hardman defended in each case. The bench, after a lengthy hearing, imposed a penalty of the single value of duty, £15.7 seven shillings and 19 shillings cost in the case of Edward Spratlin, grocer's manager, £3.1 and ninepence and 25 shillings cost in the case of Robert Day, boatman, and £2.8 and threepence and 19 shillings cost in the case of Ernest Dean, boatman. Robert Day, boatman and head of household at 12 Silver Street Dill, was arrested and convicted of smuggling on several occasions. This account of Robert Day's smuggling was printed in the Eastbourne Herald on Wednesday the 22nd of August 1900 and in the Thanet Advertiser on the 1st of September 1900. Before the Eastbourne Borough Bench on Friday, Robert Day, 32, of 12 Silver Street Dill, William Bailey, 44 of 159 West Street Dill and Samuel Pritchard, 47, a boatman of 21 Middle Street Dill, were charged on remand with being concerned together in unlawfully importing certain goods liable to duty. The boat observed coming ashore in Langley Bay and after watching for it for considerable time, the Coast Guard proceeded to the boat. The three men were sitting beside the boat having tea and when asked if they had any prohibited goods on board, they answered no. The Coast Guard searched the boat and found a large concealment of duty payable goods from which he informed the local police and the three men were arrested. The long narrow boat in which they came here in, a dill galley punt, is now lying on the beach near the rocket apparatus house in Langley Bay and measures about 28 foot by 7 foot 6 inches. The boat is called the Dizzy and she has painted on her stern the name of the owner, K.C. Grigg, Deal. The Dizzy, which has been seen on this part of the coast before, is not a new boat, and her value has been roughly estimated at £40. Found on board were 40 boxes of cigars, £144 of tobacco, and two bottles of eau de cologne, on which no duty had been paid. On the 15th of August, in the borough of Eastbourne, Mr. Bedford from Newhaven prosecuted on behalf of Her Majesty's Customs and the prisoners were defended by Dr. F. W. Hardman, LLD of Deal. The defendants, it was stated, came ashore with a boat at Langley Point 
and the Coast Guard of the Eastbourne Station discovered the tobacco and cigars concealed as ballast, while the eau de cologne was in the locker. John River Upshaw, examining officer of customs, stated that he had received from Mr Fillery, the Chief Officer of Coast Guard at Eastbourne, a certain quantity of tobacco and cigars and spirits. He has ascertained that on the £25 of cigars, £63.14 ounces of plug and £44.7 ounces of other manufactured tobacco and the 134 gallons of perfumed spirit, the treble duty amounted to £155.1 and sixpence. It was a Dutch tobacco of a very good quality, one of the best that could be bought in Rotterdam. The value of the plug tobacco, tobacco was two shillings a pound and the other manufactured one and sixpence a pound. Of the cigars, ten shillings, and of the perfume spirit, seventeen shillings and threepence. The duty leviable, being respectively on these four, was four shillings and fourpence on the plug, three shillings and tenpence on the other tobacco, five shillings and sixpence on the cigars, and nineteen and a penny on the perfume spirit. The bench imposed the full penalty of fifty-one pound thirteen shillings and tenpence on each defendant, and three months imprisonment without hard labour. A second charge of having been on board the boat for the purpose of importing certain prohibited goods was preferred against the defendants, and the mayor said, in this case, a conviction would simply be recorded. They were sentenced to three months in jail at Lewis. It was probably another factor of Robert's day's career that caused his suicide in 1903.